hundreds of workers. Observers witness commotion but see little progress. The pier never seems to get higher because as the pier grows, the whole tower sinks lower under the added weight. Its real height is never visible from ship or shore. May 2001, after a year of construction, the first floating tower is ready for a risky maneuver. Crews must relocate it and sink it into place. The margin for error, only four inches. It takes three tugs to tow this huge structure to position. Now workers slowly add seawater to the 32 compartments in the foundation. The enormous unit begins to sink. GPS monitors the positioning. Precise placement on the seabed is critical. That was a bit tricky in our mind. We were a bit uh, <laughs> afraid when we started this operation. The team has good reason to fear this step. Inch by inch, they lower the tower toward the floor of the gulf. Winches on the tugs guide it. Everything goes perfectly until the moment before the foundation touches the bed of gravel. Suddenly, the anchor to one of the tugs slips. The entire foundation moves a foot off target. A foot is three times the acceptable margin for error. To reposition it, they'll have to raise it and begin the process again at great cost of time and money. But engineers come up with an elegant solution. They decide it will be cheaper and faster to move the whole bridge one foot over from where it was supposed to go. Engineers recalculate where to put the remaining three foundations so they will line up with the first. Now the three remaining towers must be placed precisely on the recalculated bridge line. Designers of these towers faced a troubling dilemma. You need to build strong to survive earthquakes, but the more a structure weighs, the more it is impacted by earthquakes. So, to reduce mass, the pier shafts are hollow. Engineers will be able to inspect the hollow piers after the bridge is finished. Access is just under the roadway. Stairs lead down, and down, and down. This level is just the bottom of the pylon head. You take a ladder from here. And that leads to more stairs. Hundreds of them. Even this is not the bottom of the pier. It's just water level. A door provides access for outside inspections and fresh air. After climbing down the hundreds of stairs to reach the water level, Engineers still have hundreds more to go. It takes 520 stairs to reach the bottom. So we're at the bottom of the pier. We're 200 feet below the sea level and below the concrete is the seabed. At these great depths, it is not surprising that the sea tries to force its way in. It is surprising that crickets are hiding down here, somewhere. The doorways lead to empty air chambers inside the widest part of the tower foundation. Critical monitoring devices are mounted on the wall. 
This one will sound an alarm if it detects water. An accelerometer registers the slightest movements of the tower during earthquakes. To help the towers survive earthquakes, engineers designed another first. The towers are not anchored to the seabed in any way. They simply rest on top of the 10-foot thick gravel. In an earthquake, the towers will slide on top of the gravel. The fiercest shaking will not be transmitted to the other parts of the bridge. Engineers calculate that the towers will be able to slide six feet without compromising the bridge's integrity. That was beneficial to the structure because when sliding, you were in a way cutting off the maximum stress in the structure. When each pier is in place, engineers are ready to build them another 538 feet high and hang 7,000 feet of roadway from them. But there's a problem. The finished bridge is going to weigh far more than the towers do now. This added weight will make the foundation sink into the seabed, but no one knows exactly how deep. It could be disastrous for the finished bridge. Engineers must force the towers to settle now by making them millions of pounds heavier. The solution? Seawater. They completely fill each pier. The plan works. The water does cause the foundations to finish settling. Now they will be stable when the bridge is completed. May 2002, two years to deadline. Each tower is a major construction site. Barge after barge delivers concrete. The need is insatiable. The towers will rise from the surface of the water in four distinct sections. Each critically important each massively complex, each an enormous challenge in itself. First, the octagonal pier shaft rises out of the water. It supports the pier head, an inverted pyramid that serves as the base for the four pylon legs. The enormous legs meet at the pylon head. That supports a massive metal bracket where the cables are attached. Pier shaft, pier head, legs, pylon head. The entire bridge depends on their structural integrity. But engineers are about to discover they have overlooked a dangerous weak link. Greece's Gulf of Corinth hides an active seismic fault line. So the design for the new Rian Antirian Bridge must protect it from the inevitable, earthquakes. On the bridge towers, the most complex sections are the pier heads. They are 52 feet high, with sides that widen to 130 feet. Construction is well underway when new calculations reveal a dangerous design flaw. An earthquake would subject the narrowest point of the pier head to forces greater than originally anticipated. As designed, it's not strong enough. It is too late to redesign the tower, but not too late to increase the strength of the pyramid. The engineers add rebar, lots of it, more than any other part of the bridge. Inspectors are satisfied the piers are now strong enough. Construction can continue with confidence, for now. The next stage of construction is extremely vulnerable. Building the four-legged pyramid requires extensive precautions. The completed pyramid will be immensely rigid. But while the pyramid is being built, before the four legs converge at the top, the unconnected parts are dangerously weak. 
in the middle of the strait we have a fault line and you have to take into account an earthquake while you are pouring concrete, while you are putting something down with a crane. So this is very difficult. If an earthquake strikes during construction, the legs of the pyramid could move, crumble and crash into the sea. Most structures need bracing during construction, but here the contractor takes the idea to a new level. Four massive cross girders brace the legs at four different levels. A total of 16 gigantic cross beams. It is an enormous amount of scaffolding. And it is all temporary. It will be taken down when all the pieces are in place. That is a massive amount of time, money, and materials. But it's like an insurance policy. You pay, then hope you never have to use it. When the towers are finished, one of the four legs will get an elevator. The journey to the top will still be arduous. The elevator does not go all the way up. It stops where the legs converge. That is the pylon head. And it has one of the most important jobs on this cable stayed bridge. It holds the 100 foot tall blue steel bracket that secures the cables. The entire load of the roadway is anchored here through the cables. When complete, these gargantuan towers rise 538 feet above sea level, almost as tall as the Washington Monument. But there's another 207 feet hidden under the surf. So the monument would be dwarfed if placed beside the entire tower. April 2003. There are 20 months to the deadline. But there is a new urgency. Greece has been chosen to host the 2004 Olympic Games. If the bridge can be ready five months early, the Olympic flame can cross it on its way to Athens. The builders pledge to make it happen. At shore, workers fabricate roadway sections. Assembly starts with massive steel beams. It will take 186 deck sections to build the roadway across the Gulf of Corinth. The deck segments come off the assembly line, ready to be installed on the bridge. They are already fitted with anchors for the cable stays. They even have guardrails for the pedestrian walkway. But first, they need to be carried from shore to the middle of the Gulf. That is easier said than done. Each segment is larger than a tennis court. How do you lift 600,000 pounds into the air, over water? The solution is a specialized floating crane called the tack lift. It can hoist the huge roadway sections 170 feet up, carry them to the bridge, and hold them dead steady while they are installed. The work begins today and every day at dawn. The tack lift picks up a single section of roadway and inches into the gulf. Yesterday's section went right between the tower legs. It cantilevers high over the water waiting for today's section. Now, as the tack lift nears the bridge, one of its Dutch crew relays directions. The captain guides the barge, inch by inch, until the new section approaches the existing roadway. Surveyors use a laser to ensure millimeter accuracy. But there is a problem. The wind is too strong. Even the tack lift cannot hold the span steady. Two hours pass. Finally, workmen 